Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mike Zephyr and I'm an associate professor at the University of Melbourne in the Faculty of Business and Economics. And this is QMNet, the Quantitative Methods Network uh, at the University of Melbourne, which is kind of an internal, more or less informal <coughs> uh, group that, that we have um, of by and for uh, quantitative researchers and methodologists uh, across uh, the social health and physical sciences. And today we have a talk by uh, Jan Nicholas Bohm. You go by Nick, right? Right, Nick? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and you'll be talking to us today uh, on attraction and repulsion for visualizing high dimensional data. And this will be, as, as we'll see, related to nonlinear dimensionality reduction techniques. Uh, and Nick, just to give a brief uh, blurb about you, Nicholas uh, studied computer science in Weisbaden and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, writing uh, your BS thesis uh, at the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence. And you've got a master's degree, which you just presented right this week or defended with a focus on machine learning. Um, and that's what you'll be talking with us uh, today about. And um, during your studies, uh, during his studies, he spent time in Amsterdam at the Universiteit van Amsterdam and completed an internship uh, at the European Council for Nuclear Research. Um, not nuclear, nuclear, <laughs> as some past US presidents have mispronounced repeatedly. Uh, the work presented was done as part of uh, the Barron's lab. The lab is part of the Institute for uh, Ophthalmic Research, focusing on data science for vision research as part of, the comput as part of computational neuroscience. Um, so go ahead, Nick, and feel free to take over. And thank you so much for doing this. It's just, everybody, this is uh, 7 a.m., basically. Uh, for for Nick and so we really really <laughs> appreciate you uh, coming to do this yeah. all right yeah thanks for having me again um, so basically this slide has been made obsolete by Mike um, <laughs> yeah. I'll I'll talk about exactly that um, the work that I'll present here um, you can read up on that in this paper which is available as a preprint it's called the Unifying Perspective on Neighbor Embeddings Along the Attraction Repulsion Spectrum. And yeah, it's been like done with, by me, supervised by Dimitri Kobeck most closely, and Philip Behrens as head of the lab also like gave quite a bit of input. Um, all right, so the, the first motivation for uh, visualization in general is that um, we want to model data so we can give more intuitive um, insight into more or less complicated um, topics. So this is one of the first examples where John Snow modeled abstract data with not that abstract in this case. It is like he indexed the deaths by cholera spatially in London, which had an outbreak at that time, and was able to identify where a cholera outbreak was caused by, by this pump, which, well, by removing the handle, essentially, he managed to save quite a few lives and reduce the, the spread of the um, disease. So here we have quite a good intuition of where to place the points, like we have our deaths, unfortunately, and we are able to pinpoint those deaths by persons to their geolocation. So we know where to draw them. But in general, we don't have that luxury. So we have a very easy example right here. This is a square. I'm sure this is quite easy to draw for most people. Um, we, we have our four points and they're connected um, like this. This is given already, but we'll talk about that later, how to connect those points. Um, and then we can start drawing it. Well, if you have like a cube like this, I'm sure you would know how to draw that on a paper too. Um, but if we start to increase the dimensions, so this is a two dimensional hypercube, the cube is a three dimensional hypercube, but how about a four dimensional hypercube? So we have two visualizations of that right here. The left one has been drawn manually, so to say, and the right one has been drawn by the fruchtemann reingold algorithm, which uh, is a graph drawing algorithm from the 90s. This, those visualizations are hard to compare um, quantitatively right now. Maybe you could say that one is better than the other, but the, the reality is that as soon as you start increasing the point significantly, 
or start increasing the number of dimensions significantly from four to a couple hundred or 50, you would run into troubles actually drawing that manually. As such, we do have to turn to computer-aided visualizations. So I'll show you two visualizations like of the modern algorithms. So PCA is a, yeah, a well-known algorithm from the beginning of the 20th century, which is used as pre-processing or normal visualization. It is one of the linear dimensionality reduction algorithms. And then we have Force Atlas II UMAP, which um, expands to uniform manifold approximation and projection. And we have T-SNE. This uh, means T-distributed stochastic neighborhood embedding. So we can see quite straightforwardly that PCA does not quite manage to capture those the cluster structure of the data, whereas we have a better visualization in that sense uh, for the other algorithms right here. The, we will focus only on nonlinear dimensionality reductions. PCA has mostly been used as a way to initialize the, the data set at first or like starting the optimization routine by using PCA as a starting point. Um, another data set is, oh, sorry, I should talk about the data itself. This is the MNIST data set. So we have 70,000 points and each of those points corresponds to a scan of a handwritten digit. So we have our different classes. They are like basically the blue cluster corresponds to zero if I'm not mistaken. And uh, those are 28 by 28 pixel scans of images. And those can then be fed into those algorithms and then visualized. We can also visualize biological data. This is a zebrafish embryo, like single cell data taken from a zebrafish embryo. We again here have PCA, which manages to capture like the global structure of the data, but misses out on quite a few like details in this data. Like we, we don't really have a good expression of the points that essentially lie on this manifold. So this developmental data set starts or has like different hours post fertilization points where we have like after one hour we take a couple of samples after two hours we take a couple of samples four eight and then it goes on and on like the steps also expand and we can see that this developmental trajectory basically from the very beginning over time expands expands into more rich expressions and we can also see quite straightforwardly that the algorithms itself, TSNE, UMAP, and Force Atlas II, behave quite differently. We have TSNE, which manages to fill up the available space quite efficiently. Then we have UMAP, which contracts the clusters more and expresses more white space between the clusters itself. Just by the way, like this is an unsupervised learning problem. So the visualization algorithms do not have access to the labels. So they are basically not aware that those are colored differently, so to say. Um, yeah, and then Force Atlas II basically contracts the clusters even more than UMAP and takes more care of this visualization trajectory. Um, we can compare those algorithms, or this was the initial task, comparing UMAP to TSNE and then comparing Force Atlas II to TSNE. All those algorithms have a notion of attractive and repulsive forces. We will talk about that later, basically. Summarizing the uh, premise itself, we have this feature uh, figure. This is the main figure of the paper itself. You can here see what digit, basically what handwritten digit one class corresponds to. And we have this notion of attraction and repulsion. We can see by increasing the attraction, we actually get layouts that are quite similar to UMAP and to Force Atlas II at an even higher attraction value. On the other hand, like this is basically open-ended, but at some point though, the visualization does not make sense anymore. Mm. Finding this connection was not like we wanted to understand the connection between the algorithms and not like actually place them on a spectrum. This basically happened by itself, more or less. Mm. 
yeah. So this basically is the summary figure of the paper. It will be shown um, a couple more times, like one or two more times during the talk. Um, starting with a bit of maths, we have a definition of a distance-based dimensionality reduction algorithm. So it's a mapping from the high dimensional space, which we cannot quite understand yet, to a low dimensional space. Um, this is done with by apply, applying two functions to it. So I'll, I just call them F and G to, yeah, to give them a name. And the first one actually maps the entire original data set, which consists of endpoints. And every, each of those endpoints has D dimensions. You can think of D as being 50 more or less, um, and maps those into a N by N matrix. So this n by n matrix then denotes the pairwise distances. Afterwards, we can use the next function g to transform this n by n distance matrix into a low dimensional space. We again retrieve n points. So we have one point, like for every point in the data set, we have a location in the low dimensional, yeah, to, to represent it on the low dimension. And this as usually is like two or three, for this talk, it will only be two. So we can inspect it directly on the computer screen. This is a distance-based dimensionality reduction algorithm. They, like MDS would be an example or isomap. They take, take the input uh, in the high dimensional space and compute the pairwise distances. So one of the data point has a distance computed to everyone else and then this feature is used to map it into a low dimensional space. Neighborhood embeddings, on the other hand, have a further constraint that this intermediate matrix, the n by n matrix is sparse. So this is not really explicit, but like we haven't really formulated the concept of a neighborhood, but you can think of it that every point has to make constraints and choose its neighbors carefully in air quotes. Um, we will first talk about how this is done, how neighbors are chosen, and then afterwards we will talk about how they are, they are visualized by the main algorithm, so to say. So for, for the examples, or like just to have a small sample data set, to give us an example, we have a 40-point data set which features a helix which converges to the middle and the step size is decreased as we converge to the middle. So we actually have like a lower data density on the outer rim and then it increases towards the center. In the center, we have 20 points that are sampled from a two-dimensional normal distribution. So yeah, you can think of a bell curve in the middle. Um, yeah, so the first algorithm is KNN, which is a really classical algorithm for so k is a hyperparameter in this application. We can cho choose it to be any value. For k equal one, we have this point, and we only like draw a line to the closest point itself. And this is done for every point. Um, we can see that this works quite well for the um, helix. And although it does get interrupted as the data density increases. And then at the center, we have this Gaussian distribution where we actually have like points that are connected to each other, but not quite. We have no one single big connected component. So this will prove to be an issue further down the line when we actually want to visualize the whole data set. Um, yeah, if we increase the number to, to being equal to two, we actually have one big connected component. So for every point, we can find a path by following those lines to get to another point in this data set. Other issues arise, for example, the for this node A, we can see that this edge really shouldn't be here, like this connection, because we, well, as we know, uh, and I've described it, this helix does not really, yeah, shouldn't really have any notion of connecting to this point, which is far away, so to say, on the manifold. Um, since you've had talks about manifold before, we can basically, yeah, this is just generated very differently from the points in the center. 
B also has that issue, although I would say it's less problematic here because these, these points are not as far apart in the generation stage. Uh, on the other hand here, we do have quite a good connection in general and this would, could prove fruitful or not. K and N is like one of the most straightforward applications. The yeah, connecting to the closest points is not a novel idea, so to say. But uh, it does prove very robust and is actually used quite a bit. The question that immediately arises is how would you actually choose this value K? So for that, actually the unfortunate answer is there is no clear answer. Um, the, one of the options is we can look at a binary K and N classification problem. This is a really basic machine learning task where we have two classes and we want to estimate um, what class it belongs to by looking at the closest neighbors. So we, you know, going back one slide, basically we would try to, we could actually like formulate a problem is, is this point on the helix or is it sample from Gaussian distribution? And if we now get a point that's like roughly here, would be pretty straightforward to say it's on the helix. Well, if you get a point that's here, it would be harder to say. So we would ha have to decide for one class and we could do that by looking at the closest neighbors, like, and then connecting to K neighbors, we would retrieve this K and N classification problem. So this is what is being done here and the result is shown. We have this error and we have the um, values for K on the X axis. So for k equal one, the training error will be zero because it can model the data perfectly. If like the training error is the ground truth data set, so we would look at the closest neighbor of a point that we already have. And if the closest neighbor, the closest neighbor will be itself, so it can model the data perfectly, but it will have overfit to the data really badly. So you can see that in the well testing error, in here, which is just large in comparison to a training error of zero. And then as we increase the K, so as we take more neighbors into account, we actually see that those two curves start to agree more and more. Um, the original data set consisted of 500 training points and like 10,000 test points. So we could actually extend this curve. No, we couldn't extend it much more. Anyways, um, this is not as important we can start to see that at k equal 15, it agrees more or less. Um, and this is basically as good as it gets. It's a bit unsatisfying, but um, the, the, the values are quite robust. There is some research into choosing an optimal value for k, but this is um, not as well developed or really well understandable. Um, yeah, so this is the, first algorithm. And the next one that I'll demonstrate is perplexity-based nearest network, nearest neighbors. This formulates a smooth measure of K nearest neighbors. So it wants to basically smooth over this notion of what is your nearest neighbor. Mm, this is being done by using a Gaussian kernel and basically comparing the mass or like the, the magnitude of the neighbors. So for this dash dotted line, this uh, with yeah, variance one, this Gaussian kernel, we can see that the first or like the point with a distance of one to this one, we will try to find the neighbors of this point here. Um, and this would be the closest neighbor. We can see that the magnitude is about this high. Um, and for the next one, it is much lower. So we would actually express this as a ratio, like how much larger is this? than the next neighbors. And we can also see like this decreases quite significantly towards the, um, yeah, as the distance increases. Uh, calculating the perplexity is done via Shen entropy and raising that to like two to the power of the Shen entropy, which is not, which is more a technical detail for what we're concerned here. The Neighbor then is fined by having a perplexity value pre-specified by the user. This can be thought of as a K, like a smooth K, um, and we want to match that. So we do that by then, if we have a perplexity value of one, 
we would decrease the variance of this Gaussian kernel to maybe a half. This would be the dotted line. We can see that now the one has a lower uh, magnitude here on the y-axis, but two has a much lower magnitude here. So the perplexity value in turn decreases. This would have to be like repeated twice. And then we could see that here we have with the solid line, basically the only, only magnitude for the first point and the rest one do not really get any mass distributed to them. Um, looking at how that works for though the sample data set we can see here that it actually manages to do quite well and connect the almost have one single connected component except for those outliers which um, is a bit unfortunate here but I wouldn't really know how to fix that. So for the value for the case of p perplexity is equal to two we would have an issue. The, the problem is the first neighbor here for this node A again is well separable from the rest, but then trying to like find the perplexity value of two, which corresponds to having like two smooth neighbors, we run into the issue that we would have to like incorporate the next closest point. But as we can see here, this uh, dashed line, this would basically mean this is a density plot of the Scorsian kernel we have other points that are really close to this um, boundary. So they would have to be taken into account as well. We cannot just say, I want only the two closest neighbor, but since we smooth over it, we also have to form edges or lines to those next ones. And this is, yeah, can become an issue. Although in practice, we will, we will see how it performs. Um, yeah. So the last of those is more of an aside, or not really an aside, but yeah. So for UMAP, there has been a whole new theory to form those lines. Actually, they generalize the concept of a line to having simplicities of different order. So the simplex of order one would just be like two points connected with a line. And the simplex of order two would be three points, which are all connected. So going back to the example here, we would basically not consider two points and try to draw a line with, between them, but instead we would have three points and then try to like, measure how close those three points are to each other. This would be a, like, this would allow the algorithm to express more complicated data at the expense of actually blowing up com computationally. So here we have n by n, um, like an n by n matrix, for example, that we'd have to consider. Here we have an n by n by n matrix that need to be considered, like on the order of that, which just blows up computationally and cannot really be um, done with like commodity hardware nowadays. So you have an n actually like only uses a simplex of order one, which then yeah, results in basically the same algorithm as this perplexity-based nearest neighbors. Um, how do they work in practice? So we turn back to the MNIST data set. This will be like the data set that I'll show again and again, more or less. And we can see here for TSNI with a default perplexity of 30, we get this visualization. Whereas if we take a K nearest neighbors and um, yeah, basically turn it into a probability distribution, which is more of an aside, we get an embedding that looks very, very similar to the original one. And for UMAP, this UMAP NN also has this value K, which stands for K smooth neighbors. We get a visualization that looks like this and using, oh, I flipped, uh, I'm sorry, I flipped around those. So basically this is the result. No, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, anyways, the, the difference is not that large. Like the cluster shapes, are similar or the same, like the distance between those is the same. As such, like the choice of the per of the specific algorithm doesn't matter as much as the choice for the value K or perplexity itself. Although those algorithms are quite robust to the value, like the perplexity value can be chosen between 220 and 50 and the difference is not that large. So some definitions, we will only consider the first one for now, like the YI is basically the position in the in low dimensional embedding. So YI is basically here, we have 70,000 
points uh, and every yi has two dimensions so x and y coordinate and every point here is yeah one of those yi's um i then those the dimensions are like the dimension is the euclidean distance in this low dimensional space we have our affinities and the affinity can be thought of as similarity so we have a high dimensional affinity which can be hard to think about but basically how close they are in the high dimensional space and then we have a low dimensional affinity uh, yeah which can is like the inverse of the distance you can think of it like that we showed in the paper that how you compute the affinity is not the of utmost importance like if you have a one plus this to make numerically more stable or if you choose the value to just be the inverse of the distance um, and then we have a normalization constant which adds up all those similarities this is used then to turn into a probability distribution um, before we dive into how those are like the, the algorithms are defined i would like to show you the, the visualization how they optimize the embedding actually so we have here i hope this comes through so this is tsni which then has an embedding that is optimized like this. This is the early exaggeration phase. So here we have like a constraint clusters and then they pop and it expands. This, uh, the first phase is called early exaggeration. And then afterwards we have yeah, the normal optimization cycle again. This would repeat indefinitely. So for UMAP, we have a fuzzy mess that then separates itself from each other and slowly and slowly this is done by using simulated annealing um, becomes more and more stable so yeah and then force atlas 2 as the last contender actually just yeah the, the embedding i haven't really found a good way to describe how how it works but it basically just really seems really rigid and then contracts and goes into the final final layout. Those are basically the three contenders that we have here. And the optimization routines, like the animation of that, this is over all the epochs that it's being optimized, they look quite different. Mm, so it's a bit of a surprise that in the end, we can express algorithms uh, as one another by changing one hyperparameter of the embedding. Um, going back to this point, we, we can see yeah, I should have mentioned that already. So we can see that this attraction basically is done by, hey, the attraction is felt between those lines. We have an attraction between those two points if there's a line and we have a repulsion when they're between all points. So the, the, those points, those two would only feel an attraction whereas they, the other points would try to push it away from each other as far as possible. So this is why not having a connected component here becomes problematic because we could essentially push those two points as far away from the others as we would want to. And this is not really the behavior that we want because it becomes problematic when optimizing the embedding. Um, yeah. Whereas we also feel um, repulsion between those two points, even if there's a line, so that they don't like just converge or collapse into a single point in the embedding. Um, so this is like this notion of attraction and repulsion. And mathematically expressed is this is by the loss functions. So here we have a like Pij log Wij. We have the PAJ is basically a normalized version of the high dimensional affinities, VIJ. So we take the sum over all VIJs and then divide v every VIJ by the whole sum. So we get a probability distribution. Um, we can see if we compare TSNI to UMAP that those would then be quite similar up to this factor that I've just talked about. Um, on the other hand, here we have they in the end, they don't look similar here, but if we take the gradient, they become more similar. So the attraction, again, we have the exact same expression 
because this constant factor to, yeah, vanishes by taking the, when we take the derivative more or less. This, there, there's not a strict equality here shown because they're similar up to a factor here. Um, we take the gradient with respect to yi because we want to optimize the single points. So we take the derivative for every yi, then update the embedding with, what, with this gradient, and then we can like see a new visualization. This is being done for like 500 times. This is basically shown um, in the video. Like in the video, you can see how this works over the number of iterations, optimization iterations. This is the attractive part because it only acts when we have drawn a line. This is indicated by the VIJ. Otherwise it will be zero and then the attraction will be irrelevant. On the other hand, we have this repulsion, which does look a bit dissimilar we have our wij squared up here and we have one wij here. But the, as I've said, the wij is a measure of similarity. So one over the distance is also the similarity because the, as they are closer, the similarity increases because the one over a small thing will become large. And as the distance increases, this expression will also decrease. As such, we've shown in the paper that how you chose, choose the value of epsilon does not affect the embedding significantly. So if you have a one here or the default view map epsilon is like one over a hundred or a thousand. Um, and this does not, doesn't have a large effect. You can see the effect on the embedding, but it's not as large or won't place the clusters entirely different. As such, we have the same expression here for the repulsion, but in front of this, we have for TSNI, we have n over rho z, and for, gamma, for UMAP, we have only a gamma. So rho and gamma here are hyperparameters that are chosen by the person using the algorithm. By default, they are one, so this would be, um, would just fall, fall away. And, here we only have like this n over z, which normalizes the, this term essentially. Um, if they were equal, we could make a statement about the similarity, but they are not. And this z really, because it's the normalization constant, depends on all the y's. So we have a strict dependence, which this factor z, which means that this factor z will also change during the optimization routine. Um, we can, yeah, this is basically what I just said. The, it depends on the low dimensional embedding, which is denoted by the YI. We can take a look at how this Z like evolves for various values of um, rho and also N here. So this is all being computed on the data set, on the MNIST data set. We see that as we increase rho, we have, um, a decrease in this whole expression, which is not too surprising, but also the, this is a log log plot. So this means like the dependency is not linear. So it's not a surprise that it decreases because it's in the uh, denominator, but the dependence is not straightforward. The same is uh, you can see here, like we have the N increases, which because the N also has an effect on this Z, we basically took random subsamples of the MS data set to simulate an increase of the data points. Um, the, the value for this N over rho Z expression decreases. So yeah, we can also see that the expression is much lower than one, which, well, gamma is one, so the, the repulsive force is being reduced by default. You can think of it like that because this is a small factor and then reduces the repulsion or the repulsive force. For UMAP, no such thing happens. So we, we have our gamma that is equal to one, um, which is much larger than this expression. So this would actually suggest that the repulsive force for UMAP should be larger, but this disagrees with the figure that I show, show that I sh have shown, Jesus, sorry, um, that I've shown at the beginning where we basically said that TSNI has a lower, like the default TSNI has a lower attraction than UMAP. So why is that the case? 
Um, this is basically, so the, what, what is written here doesn't matter too much, but like you know, the mathematics itself, basically the only difference between, this is the equation four that I've shown before, that is not what is being optimized. Um, and this is what is being optimized. The only difference here is in the sum of how the repulsive force is calculated. So UMAP uses negative sampling to optimize the embedding, which basically means we, instead of summing over all data points, as I've said before, it only samples a few, to be precise, like a new, where new is yet another hyperparameter that is usually in the range of two to 20. So if we have a data set of a couple thousands or millions of data points, this value is really, really small. Um, it samples new data points to calculate the repulsion and says this is close enough um, to calculate the repulsive force. So, and this is basically why the effective value for the repulsion is rather different despite what has been suggested before that the repulsive force should be larger for UMAP. So the negative sampling is the cause of why UMAP actually has a stronger attraction in this framework. So yeah, the negative sampling changes the magnitude of the repulsive force. The, yeah, the negative sampling itself has been, has been introduced by um, the word to vec paper. So this is a paper on learning word embeddings from 2012, I believe. This, um, was more of an ad hoc formulation of how to optimize a probability distribution without actually calculating this normalization constant because calculating the normalization constant carries a computational burden that you sometimes don't want to pay. Um, yet it had like negative sampling itself hasn't been th thoroughly analyzed from a theoretical standpoint. So it's hard to actually make, um, to have an analysis of how negative sampling would influence the embedding quality in our case here. But like as a thought, if we increase this new, we, the bias that we observed should decrease. So by, by taking more samples, basically we should get a better estimate of the repulsive force. And this is what we have done here. So this data set is a subset of MNIST. We have sub, like, taken 6,000 data points and then visualized those. We can see here that we here have a slightly exaggerated T-SNE and here we have an unexaggerated T-SNE. This is default UMAP and then we increase the number of negative samples from five to 500 and then to 2000. And we can see that like this white space between the clusters decreases and the embedding becomes more similar to what T-SNE actually does. So it seems that this ad hoc thought that increasing the negative samples to get a better, better estimate works. The problem here though, is that this is very inefficient because now instead of taking like a small, small amount of samples, we're taking on the order of N samples. So by doing this for every of the N data points, we will retrieve a quadratic time complexity, which is not really what we would like because this is rather inefficient. This is also the reason why we even had to like take a subsample of the MS data set because for 70,000 data points, you cannot really compute this anymore. Um, what we have done afterwards to like further investigate it and make it more computationally efficient is use the barnes hut approximation for computing the repulsive force instead of sampling. So we said we, we completely removed the negative sampling from the optimization routine and instead used barnes hut which is a consistent estimator to estimate the repulsive force. And we can see here in panel C that if we take the default value of gamma is equal to one, we get an embedding that is really, really noisy and we don't have a clean separation between the clusters anymore. Um, on the other hand, when we take a really small value like gamma is equal to this one, um, which is as, well, I can just tell you that right now, the, which is the value for rho equal to four, roughly, we retrieve an embedding that looks really similar to UMAP or this slightly exaggerated T-SNE that I've talked about. Here in the bottom right corner, you can see UMAP and unexaggerated T-SNE for reference. And comparing those two to each other, 
suggests that they're quite different indeed. Um, if we would now take the value for this n over rho z expression for the unexaggerated Tsni, which is roughly one over a hundred, we get this layout, which doesn't really well look too cleanly separated either. Well, well what we did afterwards is employ this early exaggeration technique that I've shown in the video there, where we basically multiply the attractive force with a constant at the beginning of the optimization scheme to, yeah, this is basically what we simulated here, to increase the attractive force at the beginning and then later on uh, relax that. We get an embedding that does look quite similar to Tsni, at least from the intercluster distance. And by increasing or like having the default gamma value and using early exaggeration, we can see that the cluster separation is also aided, although they start bleeding into um, each other here already, unfortunately. So what we can conclude from that is that the layout that is actually created by UMAP is a result of a biased estimator for the repulsive force. So by having like a, a repulsive force that is being not reduced by a value, <laughs> like this n over rho z expression is much smaller than gamma. So you would expect the repulsive force to be larger for UMAP, but this is not the case due to the negative sampling. Um, yeah, so we have basically investigated this connection now and next up we'll turn to force atlas two. Force atlas two, the gradient here looks like this. This is basically specified ad hoc by the authors themselves. This value up here, you can think of it as a constant, more or less, for our case, what it's concerned. So HI denotes the degree of a node where, well, if you, the, the algorithm has been developed for general graph drawing algorithms. So the degree might vary over the data set. But here, since we use like a KNN and say every, every point in the data set has a pre-specified number of neighbors, this can be thought of as a constant in itself because this HI will be the same, almost the same for every point in the data set. Um, so you can just think of this as yeah, being a constant. Um, on the other hand, for the attractive force here, we're missing this WIJ value, which means the attractive forces do not decay. So for Tsni and UMAP, the, the attractive force also depends on where the points lie in the embedding. So if they're far away, the attractive force, even though we have drawn like a line between them, will be smaller. This is also the reason why we use early exaggeration, because at the beginning, the points might be far away or random, or we can't really make a good assumption about that. But by increasing the attractive force at the beginning, we can try to encourage the points to go get closer together. This is like the rationale for early exaggeration. The technique has been already mentioned in the original paper for TC. Um, for Force Atlas II, this is not the case. So this means that the attractive force will be the same no matter where the points lie in the embedding. Um, as a corollary, this also means that the repulsive force, by changing the repulsive force by a linear factor, we don't really change any, any indirect effect or don't have any indirect effect on the embedding, but we rescale the embedding because the repulsive force at first blows up the embedding and pushes all the points away from each other, but the attractive force then eventually outscales the repulsive force because that does depend on the low dimensional distance. So like as the points grow like get further and further apart, the repulsive force decreases and the attractive force will then make sure that all the points um, yeah, basically have their attraction constraint fulfilled. And this is what the final embedding will then reflect. So as such, we can, can conclude that by rescaling the, uh, like by, by changing the repulsive force for force atlas two, what we've done here, it doesn't really change the embedding. This, yeah, they, they look like the same image here. What we have done is this repulsion by degree is basically the equation that I've shown to you before. And force atlas two with a fixed repulsion means that this expression this quasi-constant has just been like replaced by a one. So HI, because we have 15 neighbors roughly, this was the default value for the experiments. This is basically 15 or 16 times 16. 
And removing that only rescales the embedding, as we can see here with those scale bars. But otherwise, they look almost identical. So this means that if we go back to the spectrum, Force Atlas II cannot really be moved by, like with the, with the thought that we have here, you cannot really move Force Atlas II on this spectrum. So it's more of a point on it. Um, yeah, this, the connection itself is unfortunately still not that well established. Why it's also like at roughly equal row, like row equal 30 is not that clear, unfortunately. Like there is not really a good explanation as to why it's at that specific point, but we know that we cannot really move it due to how the algorithm works. Mm. What we did, what we can do though, is like generalizing the loss function. So this um, has been done after the preprint has been made available. Um, the the loss for Force Atlas two can like a generalization generalization of that can be written like this, um, where we then have two further hyperparameters like an A and an R, and they are basically scaling the distance with, like the, it's the polynomial for the distance. For force atlas two, this means like the values are A is equal to one and R is equal to negative one. Um, yeah, and then we go from there. Like then the, the equation that I've shown to you before, the gradient would fall out if you plug in those values and take the derivative. Um, for A or R for that matter equals zero, they would, take the logarithm instead, because then you would divide by zero and this uh, should be avoided. And taking the logarithm then, and taking the derivative of that logarithm would basically turn, make it fine again, more or less. That's the, how it was described in the paper. Um, now we have like two more hyperparameters, so we can also make more visualizations. Um, this has been done here. You can see force at this two, the default uh, is shown in the middle. Then this is the fruchtermann reinwald algorithm that is shown at the beginning. And we can see that those, uh, like the two right, middle and right columns are more or less the same, um, but we get interesting behavior when we use this logarithmic attraction. Um, this Lindbach algorithm, this is what it was termed in the paper, who first introduced the algorithms, or like this family of algorithms looks like nothing we've really seen so far. Um, and then we also have, like, if we have this attraction zero and our repulsion forces, repulsive force is equal to minus two, we get this visualization, which could potentially be placed on the spectrum, on this attraction repulsion spectrum. We haven't really investigated this further yet, unfortunately, but this is like one of the topics for future research. Uh, note though that now we're not changing the attraction and repulsion linearly anymore. So the analog to this attraction repulsion spectrum kind of falls apart. Um, finally, we can just try to make empirical observations. And this is what the last section here will be all about. We have like, yeah, our algorithms here, TSNE, slightly exaggerated TSNE, further exaggerated TSNE and then the Laplacian eigenmaps, which it would converge to eventually. Then on the lower row, we have force atlas two and UMAP. And here we have a distance correlation. This is basically a way that, we're, that we've tried to use to quantify the similarity of the embeddings. Like the calculation for distance correlation is not that relevant. There is a paper that describes it, of course. Um, and we would want to have a high correlation when the embeddings are similar. So here we can see that it works quite well. We have uh, almost the maximum here for UMAP. Like this is basically yeah, comparing the UMAP to a range of TSNE embeddings with a very exaggeration factor. So here is the default uh, TSNE. Here is row equal four and here is row equal 30. Um, yeah, we can see the expression or the correlation coefficient is quite high here um, and it yeah, it's also like almost on a plateau for force atlas two for the value that, that we have marked. And like just inspecting it visually, we can see the cluster placements are quite like almost the same. Um, and yeah, they do look quite similar. The data set itself is called fashion MNIST. This is very similar to the MNIST data from a, from like all the data feature perspectives. They have scanned, instead of taking handwritten digits and scanning them, 
they have like taken clothing articles and scanned those. So we now have like t-shirt, like scans of t-shirts, which are the blue clusters here, trousers, blah, dresses, sandals, and so on. Um, also 10 classes, just like the digits. So this is why it's called MNIST. So it's a drop-in replacement for that. Uh, another drop-in replacement is the Canada MNIST data set. This has taken like letters from the Canada script and scanned those. We can see here that the distance correlation actually does not really work for this case. Why exactly this correlation value is as exactly the maximum at this location is kind of a mystery to me because UMAP and Force Atlas do look quite different to each other, but this would suggest that they're actually exactly the same. Um, then, you know, we already or again have our trajectory or like the attractive forces being increased and increased. Uh, curiously, the Laplacian eigenmaps here cannot really be oriented to fit with the, like to align with the other data sets, basically having the green cluster pointing upwards. For Laplacian eigenmaps, we can, because it's the eigenvectors, we could flip the eigenvectors by multiplying them. Or we can multiply the eigenvectors by any value we would like. So we can flip them by multiplying them with negative one. Um, but this only works in the x and y direction. So why it's oriented like that, I unfortunately do not have a good answer to that. Um, another MNIST drop-in replacement, and the last one is the Kuzushiji MNIST. Uh, it's like Japanese kanjis that have been scanned here. And we can see that actually the clusters are quite fragmented here. Um, like more, there is a more complicated structure in the data than we have seen previously. And yeah, again, increasing the attraction, you can see that the cluster placement really still stays quite consistent here. And for Force Atlas 2 and Rho equal to 30 as well, the, as to why the distance correlation is not working as great here, although not too bad, to be fair, is because of this baby blue, baby blue cluster that is pointing upwards here and is pointing downwards here. Um, so the distance correlation really seems to not align with what you would perceive visually as similarity. So this is basically one of the drawbacks of using this function. Also, that being said, like the, the absolute value of the distance correlation doesn't matter too much. It's only like the, the relative value. So like you can't say oh, force atlas 2 is closer to t because the distance correlation is higher. Um, this doesn't matter. So you have to yeah, inspect the curse in isolation. Um, nevertheless, like this similarity still seems to be there. So turning to developmental data, we have first simulated data and we can see here that TSD increasing the attraction again. Um, we have our trajectory from having a discrete cluster structure, like having all the clusters visualized by themselves as small blobs is apparently the focus of the unexaggerated TSD and then increasing the attraction or using those algorithms, we can see that this developmental trajectory that we have simulated here, basically by all, only shifting the points by a, a constant um, or the clusters, we, this becomes more important as we increase the attraction. So there is an inherent trade-off between having a discrete cluster structure and having a more continuous cluster structure as we increase the attraction. Um, yeah, this can basically be inspected with the intermediate steps where the clusters contract, contract, but we still have white space between them. And then for yeah, this, the case of rho equal to 30 and force atlas 2, we can see that we basically already have our line. And here we don't have a cluster structure really anymore, but it's only this necklace of points. Um, yeah, with that being said, we can look at like real, real world developmental data. So here again, we have the uh, human organoid that is like yeah, this Troit line lab paper from 2019 made this data set available. We can see that TSNI tries to fill the space that it has allocated. And then we have our other contenders that pronounce a developmental trajectory more, like pronounce the continuous feature of the data set more. So here we have our like the extraction of the single cell data or like the, the single cell consists of like what we visualize here are the gene expressions. So we have our gene expressions in this data set. This is 
quite a large matrix, so, but it's sparse because not every cell has every gene. Um, this is then being like pre-processed, uh, so we only keep the most informative gene expressions, and then we can also further reduce them with PCA to like a 50-dimensional data set, so we can visualize or work with that more straightforwardly. Um, here we see like at the beginning data points were extracted. This is the dark blue cluster basically. So here actually they don't perfectly align, but it's more or less fine. And this is also being um, pronounced more and more that this developmental trajectory is also like on one continuous line. Um, as we increase the data, uh, the days, no, as the time passes, we um, can see that the or single cell data diverge more and more and like form more complex behavior. Um, this is, yeah, for the data set here at hand that we consider, we have chosen KHV equal to 15, but like for reference, we have also perplexity value was chosen to be 30, like this analog that I showed at the beginning, perplexity is equal to 30, is very similar to K is equal to 15, um, has been used throughout. Um, and increasing both values, k and perplexity, by 10, then we can inspect that this similarity see, still seems to hold. Although, like this is basically starting to get squished, with, which is like a thing that needs to be considered for teasing with very high exaggeration. Um, that yeah, this is more of an aside and is mentioned in the appendix of the paper if you are interested in that. Um, yeah, so here we have increased the value for the nearest neighbors. So we have increased the neighborhood size by a factor of 10. We can see that the similarity still seems to hold. Um, another developmental data set from the same paper is the one of the chimp organoids. So they've taken like single cell data from a chimpanzee brain. Um, and the, the same developmental trajectory with the, of the gene expressions can be observed here. Well, there are like minor details that are different. For example, this red cluster is placed here for UMAP and for TSNI it's here, but this is not the most significant. Um, increasing the neighborhood size by 10, again, we have, yeah, the, the same relationship still, still seems to hold. Although like the cluster structure itself is a bit different and this is exactly the, the difference, or it's not exactly, but this is due to the difference of uh, affinity calculation. So the similarity calculation that I've talked about um, during the talk, how you actually define the similarity between data points, um, it causes this cluster to be like not as large as this blue cluster here. All right, this is now a data set from a Hydra, like single cell data set from a Hydra. Here we have interstitial, endoderm, and ectoderm data. And we can still see that like the cluster structure actually really aligns quite well with each other. Um, yeah, and this continuous, continuous features are being highlighted more and more. And you can see this by having like small points interspersed between the clusters actually, where this is debatable whether you would want it, like whether you would want to have them spread between those, or whether you would like want to have like impure clusters more or less. Um, yeah, the cluster placement itself seems to be the reason for the um, noise that we can observe here, where we can see that UMAP has quite a large value or a higher value than force atlas two at the beginning and force atlas two peaks around the value that we have seen here or that we have shown here. Mm. Going on, we have data set of a zebrafish embryo where we have that I've shown at the beginning as well. Again, we can see this developmental trajectory with those clusters really being condensed for like the, yeah, having infinite attraction here. Um, again, the distance correlation seems to indicate similarity and we can also inspect that visually. The last data set is the one of a mouse cortex uh, from Tazek et al. from 2018. So we can again see this, yeah, this continuous spectrum. And at the end, we have all the plasin eigenmaps here because the connected component does not exist. As I've talked about at the beginning, we don't really have any continuous structure, but instead we only have six points 
here we actually have added Gaussian noise to make those clusters more um, more visually actually that you can notice them. But uh, in general, like the this is a feature of the Plasin eigenmaps. If you don't have one single connected component, you get an embedding that just consists of points where every point um, is one of those components. So if there are no, this means that there are no edges between this cluster basically and that cluster. Mm. Yeah, and this, yeah, those similarities you can basically see for yourself whether this works out. The, cl the colors here have been taken from the paper before that they were indicative of the time. And here I have to admit that I'm actually not quite sure of what the labels are supposed to mean. Um, if you want to know that, you can read up on in this data set, uh, in this paper. So the conclusion is that we have our intermediate um, stages on this attraction repulsion spectrum and not just the convergence towards Laplacian eigenmaps with the infinite attraction. And they are of interest because we can highlight different features of the data, like trying to pronounce the discrete data structure more or trying to get the continuous features to come out more and more. And all those algorithms are in active use in, in the transcriptomic community. So like single cell data set use all those algorithms to visualize those single cell data and their gene expressions to then make, um, to then like try to make assessments about the data set at hand. Um, yeah, what I've also hopefully convinced you of is that it's not tied to any particular algorithm, but the optimization routines have an impact on how this works, and this can then be placed on the attraction repulsion spectrum. Open questions that are like came up during the research project or the investigation here are like a formal analysis of negative sampling would be nice to actually be able to assess the bias. Then having fractional exponents for this attraction repulsion model that I've shown you with our A and R, we can also use like non-integer values for the exponents. This has not been investigated yet, but could prove interesting, although it does make it compu yeah, computationally a bit more complex because we don't have good optimization routines for raising something to the square root of two, for example. Um, another thing, since I haven't really talked about the Plasin eigenmaps or haven't introduced them formally, um, they trying to realize the repulsion potential for those would actually mean that we could express the Plasin eigenmaps with the repulsion potential to, to show something similar to TSNI. This would be great because the Laplacian eigenmaps are like the computationally the most pleasing because we have an eigen decomposition. Uh, and this can be done quite quickly for sparse data that we have here. And this would basically mean we have analytic good solutions for TSNI because Laplacian eigenmaps have been like under the most theoretical scrutiny out of those four algorithms that I've presented here. And yeah, acknowledgements. So I would really like to thank my supervisor and the professor. Then we also had help from those people or yeah. And then some others helped as well. Um, and finally, yeah, thanks for the invitation. And this is it. Those are the references and thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Nick, uh, for, uh, for, for that talk. And, and obviously again, for, 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 for providing it so early. Um, uh, I definitely have a question, but I would like to, for anyone who, um, who's been holding off and, and wanting to, to, to say something or be getting some claps there. Uh, does anybody have, uh, does anybody want to kick it off and, uh, just, uh, if anybody has to go, obviously feel free. Um, but, uh, would anyone like to, to ask any questions? You feel free to jump in. I can go ahead. Um, so one thing obviously that people want are, 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 are quite often wanting is some kind of optimal solution, you know, in a non-relative kind of absolute sense to problems mm -hmm. of dimensionality reduction. And obviously one thing that your work, as well as the, just the very existence of a diversity of different methods that result in different kinds of um, solutions to the, to the problem of dimensionality reduction um, highlights is the fact that uh, not, I mean, one way to see it, I guess, would be kind of different starting assumptions um, can lead to very different ways of, um, 
of representing um, the, the data points in, in low dimensions. And so we obviously have nice visual depictions of those differences um, in, in, as, as you've shown us. So <clears throat> what, do you, what would you say to people who are looking for the best solution? You know, so somebody comes to you, they have a, right, they, they have a data set and it's in high dimensions and they say they want a low dimensional representation, but they also want to, of course, capture any nonlinear structure in the data. And so you say, well, let's do a neighbor embedding. <laughs> <laughs> and then they say, okay, well, what, what type of neighbor embedding should I do? Um, I want the best one. I want the right one. Um, but obviously what you're saying is that, you know, there, <laughs> you're going to get different results depending on the optim optimization method you use. So what do you say to, what do you say in cases like that? Yeah. So obviously as, of, as you have highlighted, um, the, the answer is not straightforward. You could basically try to see um, this is being done when you compare like an algorithm of the quality, try to do that. You can see how the neighborhood relationship changes between the high and low dimension. So basically you have the concept of neighborhood in the high dimension that yeah. is being like drawing those lines. And then like in the low dimension, you can just like, well, you do it with a computer, but you could inspect it, like see, okay, wh where is my closest neighbors or like my K closest neighbors in the low dimension. And then you can see, okay, what's the difference between those two? So basically this is called neighborhood preservation. Um, yeah. And then you can also compute that for various values of K, like say, okay, I wanna see my first hundred neighbors, but also 200 and see how that changes. Like as I increase the number of neighbors, how, how, how much does it change? And then in the end, you can interpret it as you consider more and more neighbors you try to assess the global structure of the data. Whereas if you have a small neighborhood that you only consider, you would more focus on the local features. Um, but yeah, again, this is already like, you cannot say what is better. You right. have to like make concessions as whether you need want global data, uh, like global features, local features, or um, yeah, something else. So neighborhood preservation would be one of the options to actually assess right. what is the best for your case at hand. That's right. You know, one thing too that seems quite interesting is that, um, and this, this comes up repeatedly in kind of the history and philosophy of science as well, and that is the role of aesthetics and aesthetic judgment and making determinations about the validity of a method. And so here we have another nice example of it, you know, where, at, where what people will be doing is they're really just comparing these pictures. The right these visualizations and low dimensions that you've generated and say oh yeah i can see that one maybe looks like it's a bit problematic and you know but the criteria that are being used for that aesthetic judgment um don't always necessarily map um you know very well to quantitative measures of you know whether or not method is going to be a good kind of recover for example clusters or whatever in within a data set or um and so this this crops up all the time right in physics and elsewhere they'll say things like Oh well, you know the differential equation. We we you just tell it's right because uh, because it's so beautiful, it's so simple, or so you know. So there's always this this <laughs> there's, there's this role of aesthetics, um, and that just seems like your you know your work is highlighting that here again. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, on, on the one <laughs> hand, you can make some uh, assessments as to like whether the the purity of the clusters, basically, as I've shown at the very beginning. PCA on the MNIST data set doesn't right. quite capture like the different clusters. So you have impure clusters. This would be like one way to try to assess it. But yeah. in the end, the, the data itself is also very important. Well, the, this developmental trajectory in well, biological data sets often like is of course suggests that you would want more attractive force in the data set. So you can highlight the continuous features more. So Yes, on one hand, it is very subjective as you what, as to what you like. Um, and on the other hand, there are some basic things that you would have to consider as well. Yeah. Right. Okay, cool. Does anybody else want to chime in with anything? We've, uh, I, I know it's, it's getting late on a Friday for us. Um, and, uh, and then we're an hour and 15 minutes into it. So it's totally fine. And, and obviously we'll put this online and then everybody can watch it. Um, We've got a message from Katarina. Thanks, Nick, for a great talk. Uh, and um, and actually, I guess one of our upcoming speakers will um, will talk to the will speak to the question of optimization. Um, 
more yeah. or less directly and, and, and treating these, um, the different uh, dimensions as I guess latent variables, um, <clears throat> which should be familiar mm -hmm. for people who deal with the kind of linear case, you know, factor analysis and whatnot. Um, yeah, like that is also interesting because here we obviously only consider two dimensions, but this paper that you mentioned, like the PNAS paper, also yeah. like has like considers higher dimensionality and this has not been really a focus for us so far. So, right. Yeah. Mm. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll stop this recording. Yeah.